Gotcha. Okay, so I think we're good. Um, so let me, I guess, give the, the formal introduction. Um, and then I'll let you take it away, uh, Larry, after the uh, formal introduction. So welcome, everybody. Uh, we're so excited to have you join. So this is our second meeting for the fall. And this is our first company information session. So um, welcome to all of you that are new um, this session. And for those that were in the session um, last week and were like, oh, this MISA, this is cool. This is exciting. Um, and you joined again today. We appreciate it and uh, hope you continue on and um, hang with us at least every Thursday for the fall. Um, so tonight we're excited, like I said, to have our first company information session. So you got to, heard, you got to hear a little bit from, uh, from Larry as he was talking and, and he, we're so appreciative and grateful that he was able to uh, provide his time to jump in uh, because he's got so many things going on and, and so many obligations and we're so appreciative to have him. Um, so Larry, as he was mentioning, um, has been a big proponent and supporter of MISA. He's been involved in MISA longer than I have because he was helping out with Dr. Conley before I even came in. Um, Larry's done an information session at least once a year. Um, we used to have some of the um, social events um, and happy hours. Larry sponsored a bunch of those. Um, and then we also had last fall, I believe it was, uh, a company tour at Rocket Matter. Um, so we're just very grateful uh, for him. And uh, Larry's just a great... Um, example of somebody like when he talks about his story to kind of see how um, things don't always start out how you maybe expect but as long as you're putting in the work and you're trying different things out and um, obviously you're diligent in what you're doing that you can be um, successful like him and have your own um, company and have so many other branch out companies from things that he's done and even his own even his own book so um, with that, can we give a nice warm uh, round of applause for Larry Port from Rocket Matter? <laughs> Virtual. Thank <home>. you. <laughs> hey, all right. Uh, first of all, thank you, Jonathan. That is so nice. I mean, uh, to me and everybody in my family, I'm just kind of, um, you know, some sort of like schmuck who kind of lives in the house. But yeah, when you put it like that, I guess you've been doing work long enough, like you do enough stuff. Um, it, it feels good. Um, so... My company is Rocket Matter. Um, like Jonathan said, my name is uh, Larry Port and I founded it and I run Rocket Matter. And it's a software company. We, I live here in Boca Raton, Florida. I, I really wish I could be there. Um, but, um, you know, we provide software for law firms. It's very simple. Um, you know, we basically allow them to capture their time, work on the cases that they work on and be able to like send out invoices and process payments and things like that. So it's really like office organizational software and, and different uh, professional services have similar things. There's uh, practice management software for lawyers like ours. There's practice management software for accountants, for doctors and so on and so forth. So we're kind of in that category of things. So that's what we do. Um, before I go any further, I do want to tell you that like, I think it is like, of critical importance that you are participating in MISA. Uh, so I, 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 when we as employers look to the local university to hire young talent, and we do have to hire talent, um, it's very overwhelming for us because a school like FEU is huge, and um, where do you go? So you can go to the career fairs, um, the career fairs are typically dominated at FAU because of the, the accounting department. They're typically dominated by companies like Ernst & Young and PricewaterhouseCoopers and things like that. So, you know, and then there's the Owl Career Link thing, which is great, but it's, you know, students aren't necessarily engaged with that and so on and so forth. So having a relationship with MISA is great because MISA has a relationship with industry and companies like mine. So the fact that you're participating at all in an extra extracurricular activity like this means that you have skin in the game, that you're really interested in what you're doing. And, and for you, it goes beyond the classwork. And that's a huge signal to people like me that this is somebody who cares about what it is that they're doing. Okay, so that's my little Misa pitch. Um, <clears throat> awesome. Was that good, Jonathan? That was awesome. Okay, perfect. Um, now, uh, let, I guess, um, you know, I, if, if there's people on the call, and, and what I'd like to do is I'd like to talk a little bit about 
how I got my career started and how Rocket Matter came to be. And um, if that's okay with you, that's where I'd like to start that's because perfect. I think that would be most instructive. And, 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 and Jonathan, let's make this interactive. I mean, I know people are always like hesitant to ask questions and stuff like that in a public forum, but let's make this as interactive as possible. So you please interrupt me. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and, and, and students, if you, I don't know how, what the system works. If you want to text Jonathan through the chat window or, if you want to just ask me directly, I'm fine with that too. Just, uh, you know, uh, tell me your name and, you know, what you're studying and stuff like that when you ask the question. But um, I, uh, yeah, I would love, I would love to make this as interactive as possible. Yeah. So we can do all that. So if you want uh, anybody on the, on the call, you can either write in the chat or like I said, if there's, if there's like a little bit of a pause in the, in the video, you can just pop your mic on, ask Larry the question. Like I said, tell him who you are, what your major is. Um, and then he can try to, to answer it. So whatever you, whatever you as the students feel most comfortable with, but all the MISA officers will be watching the chat. So if I see something pop up, I'll just, I'll just say, hey, such and such student said such and such thing. So. <laughs> all right. Perfect. Perfect. That's awesome. Um, I guess, uh, you know, before I start, like, um, you know, what, what kind of majors do we have in the room? Yeah. So you'll have predominantly uh, MIS students. Um, you have some students that are in my ISM 2000 class, that's introduction to technology. So for some of them, you have like pre-business. Um, some of them you have um, some of that are going like, let's say into just a regular education for, you know, like K through 12. You have some that are doing like um, um, other, you know, majors across the college uh, because it's kind of a general elective. Um, and then you also have within the uh, MIS students um, you have those that are doing security, analytics, um, you know, some are, are also like minoring in computer science and maybe double majoring in MIS and computer science. So you kind of have a mix, you have a mix of, of students. And then obviously within the business, you have students that are doing accounting, finance, marketing. So you got a, you got a pretty good broad group of, of backgrounds here, Larry. Okay, great. All right. All right. Good. And all very valuable uh, majors, by the way. Uh, my actually, my undergraduate degree was in film, um, and actually Spanish too. Uh, but um, I uh, I ended up um, double majoring Spanish and film, and um, I worked in the film business for a little bit um, and did not like it at all. Um, I had like no a big clue is is that there was nobody whose life I wanted. Like, you know, there's no, I had no role models um, in that business. Um, so, I mean, personally, I did not like it at all. Um, so give me one second, Jonathan, I got to switch no problem. my audio no here. Um, so with that, I can just jump in. Thanks for everybody for posting your majors and your names in there. So like I said, we got people that are doing MIS with minor in information security, MIS business analytics, computer engineering, um, MIS, analytics, economics. Um, we got some that were recent MIS graduates, accounting, uh, MIS in cybersecurity, another one in cybersecurity. Uh, so we got, like yeah. I said, a, a really nice mix. Okay. Uh, All right. Perfect. Um, and so um, <clears throat> I ended up um, after the whole uh, thing with the film business, um, like I, I really realized that, that was not for me. And that's important to, I think to recognize because even for you guys, you might find out that you work in the industry for a year or two. And if you really don't like it, and if you're not. I think, I think we lost, we lost his audio over there. So rip, Just give him a, give him a second. Womp, womp, womp. That does happen a lot. Yes. Hi, I'm back. Oh, I'm there back. we go. Sorry about Welcome that. Welcome back. Um, yeah, we're going to have a couple of uh, snafus here as we uh, transfer kind of uh, equipment and stuff. Hey, this, um, this, this is technology at its finest, right? The, 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 yeah, it is. The, the, the ability to even be able to do what we're doing here and the extreme level of multitasking that you're able to do, Larry, is uh, commendable. <laughs> Thank you very much. So, um, okay. Um, you know, the... What I was basically warning everybody is that if you start your careers out and there's no role models for you, then forget about it. Then something's wrong, right? You probably want to look at a different thing. And that's what happened to me. So it was the late 90s. Um, 
You guys still with me? Yep. Yeah, we're here. Okay. So it was the late nineties and um, I went, uh, I, the internet was going crazy. So you guys are probably too young to remember, but like when, in the late nineties, there was this massive like internet uh, stock market bubble where like on the Super Bowl, like every single advertisement was for an internet company. And there were all sorts of crazy internet companies. Like there was like allergy.com. There was like anything.com. Anything that had .com in it was like instantly worth like a billion dollars. So, um, so I go and I decide to enroll in school to study computer science so I can be part of this whole internet thing. Of course, while I'm there, that like as, as all things do, what goes up must go down, um, you know, the bubble crashes and um, adios all those jobs. So luckily in grad school, um, I got some experience working for the computer science department. I ended up landing on my feet. I got a job on Wall Street, Wall Street which by the way, pays very well, as I'm sure you might guess. And, um, and in fact, Wall Street jobs, this is just something to keep in your back pocket. But if you think about it, like Wall Street jobs like Morgan Stanley or Goldman Sachs or people like that, like those firms like actually reward you for working in places like Hong Kong or Tokyo or London because of the international market. So I ended up in this world and I ended up programming trading systems for uh, Morgan Stanley. And they take real good care of you and it's a great culture, believe it or not. And um, you work with really bright people. So that was my first real professional job um, coding. Um, and uh, I loved it. So uh, when uh, my wife got pregnant, we decided to move to Florida because we wanted to be near family. And that turned out to be an amazing decision. I ended up getting a job at Ultimate Software in Weston, Florida. So at Ultimate, it was like not as, it wasn't like financial. Is it, I don't know if anybody here works at Ultimate or anything like that, but it's, it's human resource software. So, you know, when I was at school, I was working on defense department software when I was, so that was my job when I was working at NYU. When afterwards I was at Wall Street and I was doing trading software and then I was working on human resource software. So you, you start to realize that you get to learn all these different business domains and it's just a question of learning how people work and building the software for them. And at that point, I was maybe a professional developer for like maybe five years, six years. And um, I was confident enough that I always wanted to build something more than I wanted to build a business. I wanted to like build a piece of uh, software from scratch. And that's when I ended up building Rocket Matter. My business partner at the time and I identified this need and we built the software. And then what happened was, is that we identified a real need and people started buying it. And the next thing I know, it's like 12 years later and I employ like 40 people. It's kind of weird, but that's kind of the, that's the story in a whole nutshell. And uh, right now um, I'll, I can talk a little bit more about the company story, but that is my own personal journey. Um, any questions so far? Let me just see on the chat. Anybody have any questions? So like you can either pop your mic on and off or if you want to write in the chat and then we can sort of uh, let Larry know anything about his uh, story, about how he got started. If you don't have a question, that's fine too. Um, oh, so nothing but, yet. They uh, said. Well, actually I do, I do have one question over here. You said your major was in uh, film. What specifically in film? Are you talking like directing or editing or, or, or what, what aspect? I was really interested in um, documentary, documentary and educational film production. Um, so like, in, in fact, it was kind of interesting. I got, like met Mr. Rogers. I, I had internships at like uh, some of these public television stations. That's what my focus was. And so I was working for, I was really fascinated with like IMAX production. Um, and then I ended up um, working the, the, the computer thing. It wasn't just all the internet happening at the same time. It was also the fact that um, I was really good with the editing machines because they use as if you guys, I'm sure you, I, I don't know, I'm sure, but you, if you've edited a video, um, you know that it's like uh, intuitively, it's like you drag things around, you drag the images around. Didn't used to be like that, right? It used to be like reel to reel and so on and so forth. So there was a period of time where um, editing shifted from analog tapes like that and, and processes to video, to, to digital computers. And for some reason, I was just, I just was able to figure them out better than anybody else like around me. 
And so that was one clue that like, huh, maybe I really should be around these computer things. And then the internet was happening and all those uh, crazy late nineties parties were happening with the internet companies. And that's kind of what led me there. But yeah, um, that's, that's what I was doing in, in, in film. And you never know, maybe one day I'll return to it. But uh, for now, I'm happy doing what I'm doing. Um, <clears throat> yeah, you had, you had someone else uh, ask in the chat here. Um, they said, uh, what is it like to start um, from scratch building your software? And how did you decide the direction to take for the software? That's a good question. Okay. So um, I guess that's a good segue right into the company then. <laughs> yeah, it's perfect. It's a perfect segue. It's like a fastball down the middle. Um, so what happened was, is that I had my like kind of ear to the ground looking for opportunities. Um, so I had, I, I was like kind of offering myself as like kind of a consultant in my spare time. And I would pick up these little like websites here and there, but nothing substantial. And then a friend of mine called me who was an attorney. And then what you know, you guys are probably like young professionals, but you know, when you become like, by the time you're like 30, you're going to know a lot of lawyers, like a lot of your friends are going to become lawyers. So um, they were, and, and it wasn't just isolated to this one guy, a bunch of them were telling me how much their like law office software just like t totally sucked. So what I did was I took a look at it and they were right. It was garbage. It, I mean, it, all these softwares that are written on like Windows 95 and like super ancient user interfaces that um, you would never even see unless you worked in a business context. Like no consumer software is like, look like anything like this stuff. Um, and I was trained in, you know, I had that visual background and I also had um, the web background because I, I've, I've only been building web-based software and this was all like old Windows stuff. So um, the idea came from that. It came from like a, the observation that um, law firms had terrible software and there were no web-based alternatives, which I could not believe because this was in 2006. And just for a little context, in 2006, Salesforce was already like a nine-figure revenue company, right? Um, and they may have even made a billion dollars by then. I don't, I don't really know, but I know the company that I was at was a nine figure company and they were just making HR and payroll software online. So um, everybody had been online banking at that point in 2005. And that time frame is when Google maps came out and it really shifted the way that you could program on the web. That's when like Ajax and XML callbacks started coming out. And um, <clears throat> it just like made the web explode. And that's it, the whole movement was called web 2.0. And that's, that's when things like Reddit came out and big came out and delicious and all these and the predecessors to the social networks and all this like really rich web functionality came out back then. So that was when, and that's what I was expert in, I knew how to do all that kind of stuff. So that was the environment in which the opportunity was born. Now, um, <clears throat> another thing that was big back then was something called Ruby on Rails, which is still used. Um, so Ruby on Rails, is a web framework built on Ruby um, that allows you to quickly develop uh, web applications. Um, it's not drag and drop by any means, but what it does is it, it really formally, uh, it, it really normalizes what, how, it, and, and if you're not a programmer, forgive me, but it really um, normalizes how your classes are named, how the databases are named, how the tables relate to one another um, and it, it, cause a lot of this stuff is auto generated and it has a whole like, uh, runtime thing, like an execution task tool that makes all this kind of stuff happen. I forget what it's called now, but I was considering building on Ruby. So I studied Ruby and I built like some small little, uh, sample applications on it. And then I realized that I would probably have trouble hiring people that knew Ruby in South Florida, but I would not have trouble finding people that knew how to program in .NET. And I also knew .NET inside and out, and I didn't know Ruby very well. And I knew that I could get to the finish line quicker if I did .NET. So basically the technology, the, the fundamental technology decision, which was a big one because we're still living with it today, was to build on the .NET platform. And, you know, and, and, and but I modeled it after how Ruby on, Ra uh, Ruby on Rails was structured. So um, how the classes were named, the task execution environment, um, all that kind of stuff that the way that Ruby beautifully um, version controlled the databases were things that I was, uh, that I emulated with the thing that I created when I created Rocket Matter. So um, it was, 
I, I mean, I really was like very into at that time uh, of my career, I was really into doing things the right way. Like, um, you know, not having too many columns in the database, having great relations between the tables, having perfect class structures, doing test driven development, all those kind of things. And that's what I wanted to do is I wanted to see if I could take these th things that I had been learning and build my own thing. Because when you go out in industry and you work on somebody else's software, at least at Ultimate Software and at, at Morgan Stanley, I was working on such horrible code, like um, really poorly designed databases, awful technology decisions that had been made years before by people that didn't know what they were doing um, that related in maintenance nightmares. So I wanted to do things the right way. And I'm you know, happy to say that like, I've actually gone back into the code base recently and it's in pretty good shape. Like it's still the way um, fundamentally the way that I designed it initially. Hmm. So <clears throat> does that help with the uh, initial technology conversation? Oh yeah, that was great. And someone else had asked uh, what languages did you learn or that you end up utilizing in the actual development. So you, you, you kind of touched on that with .NET. Uh, was there anything else that you, that you were utilizing? You talked about Ruby on Rails and some of the other things, but that was another question that was in the chat. Yeah, Ruby on Rails was mostly like an academic exercise for me and I was exploring it to see if I would want to use it. So I use like, so, you know, the, 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 fun, the, the core technologies are um, at the time were JavaScript and you know, the DHTML languages, you know, JavaScript, HTML, CSS, um, C Sharp, um, you know, and it was a Microsoft SQL instance. Now all of it's evolved, right? So like when we initially, uh, you know, deployed um, Rocket Matter to our very first law firm, we didn't even host it. We basically installed it on like a $250 tower called an e-machine and ran it in some law firm's office before. And then what happened was we ended up leasing servers at uh, Rackspace because back then you didn't have um, Amazon EC2 instances and, and Microsoft Azure for hosting and things like that. We actually, we had to have like these rack mounted servers that we leased that we had to configure on our own. Um, and, and so that was like pretty expensive to do. So, but um, there was a company called Rackspace that we used for that. Um, the other technology decision that was a big one is a, a major decision that you have to make if you're going to, uh, and I can tell you guys this because you guys are a bunch of technology guys. Um, you have to decide if you're going to do a multi-tenant database, meaning like multiple users on one a software application. If, if every, um, basically this is your conundrum, will all of your clients have their own database separated out um not database server but like a database server like sql server can have like a gazillion databases on it i don't know what the theater i think it's like a theoretical limit that it has but like that's how ours is done or are you going to have one database um and are all the firms going to be differentiated um with like a firm id column in those tables Jonathan, does that make sense? That's the fundamental conundrum you have if you're designing a multi-tenant database, and it's worth exploring this question, actually. Yeah, I think that's good because that, that uh, you know, we have the students that are doing MIS. Some of them are taking the database class now, so I think it's helpful uh, when you're bringing up kind of these real-world applications of dilemmas that you come in, you know, in contact with, and then kind of that decision process that you go through. So, um, so okay, good. All right, good. So the reason initially that um, I chose the model that I did and we still use that model um, is that when everybody has their own data isolated in their own database, as opposed to commingled into like what they call God tables that has everybody's data in it. That's, and you use the firm ID to separate out um, your, your given clients your, your client ID to get to, to filter out their information with, you know, where clause or something. Right. Um, it's just, it was just safer that for us not to commingle data. I felt that, like I did not want to accidentally reveal anybody else's data. And I'm sure I would be careful with the joins, but, and, and all those different kinds of things, but I just did not want an incident where I was revealing one law firm's data to another. So I felt the safest way to do that was to isolate them in their own databases. And we used that as a selling point. Now, it turns out that that has another major advantage um, down the road um, because you can imagine if you're doing web-based software, you're going to be updating your software. Um, you're going to, uh, for example, um, have to um, roll out a new feature and your tables are going to have to change. So 
what it allows you to do, if, if you have everybody in like one database with like one God table, then it makes it very difficult to have multiple environments, right? Because we um, have everybody separated into their own database, we can group databases and we can assign them to their own environments so that if we roll out a change, we can roll that change out only to that group of people. Um, so um, the flip side of the argument is that like, if you, when you have like changes to the database, it is a lot faster to deploy them to a single database than to like thousands of them. So those are the pros and cons you kind of have to weigh and it's up to each uh, individual like kind of business case to decide like which way to go. But um, I'm, ultimately I'm very happy with the path that we chose. Does that make any sense at all? I, I can't tell. Yeah, I think, I think everybody is uh, enjoying that and, and especially those that are doing the database class and if they took it, I think it helps you know, apply some of the things that they're talking about in the class when you're going through some of these decisions um, versus how they actually play out um, in the real world. So that's awesome. Uh, we did have another question. Um, someone asked, um, how did you handle like um, information security and those things like in the early days, like to keep everything, um, you know, secure in terms of your data? So, um, Security obviously is like a huge concern and it was a major concern when we went to the marketplace because attorneys, and I don't know if you know this about them or not, but like if you tell an attorney a secret, even if they don't represent you, they will take your secret to the grave. Like they take confidentiality like extremely seriously. In fact, if they violate client confidentiality, they can be disbarred. So it's like it's beaten into them um, from day one of law school. So, you know, for us, like revealing client information was like a serious no-no. Like that, that, like there's, like that would put us out of business. So we had to be very cognizant of that from day one, um, and we basically um, built like like we used the .NET framework, which had a lot of like basic security features in place. So it had an, an authentication framework. It had protection against standard attacks such as like SQL injection, cross-site scripting, and things of that nature. Um, you know. Uh, all data access at the time was done through stored procedures because in a stored procedure, there's no way to inject SQL into a stored procedure because everything has to be passed in with named parameters. So, um, you know, so the databases were protected by that. Also, like I said, the decision to uh, separate each database out, each client out into its own database rather, um, also enhanced security. So we did, we made some decisions that were designed from the ground up uh, with that in mind. Um, and then we also like started employing like, you know, tools like um, you get someone, you can hire people that are like expert in security to help you out with that and take a look and make sure you're not doing anything boneheaded. And um, you can also employ services like, uh, like their automated services that can probe your uh, account nightly or your, your databases nightly for uh, new breaches because when you're updating software on a continual basis one problem that you have is that you may introduce a vulnerability so it's helpful to have like kind of a nightly scan service like what McAfee um, provides to just like do automated tests against your uh, system and then as we've gotten bigger you know we've been able to like engage like white hat hackers and that's been a lot of fun you it kind of sucks when you get the bill because it's expensive but you pay these guys to see if they can break into your account. And it's one thing to have an automated thing, see if they can break into your account. It's another thing to have like, you know, smart people who are creative try and break into your account that can try all sorts of different weird things. Mm -hmm. And um, I was pretty happy to report that we were in very good shape. So that's how we attack security. Awesome. Um, so I don't see anything else in the chat. So does, does anybody else have anything um, that they want to Ask Larry, so you can either write in the chat or you can pop open your um, mic if you want to ask him, you know, with your audio, so. That's good, because I was getting intimidated. Those are good questions. <laughs> so, um, um, let's see. So I, got, I got a new one that just came in. It said, uh, what kind of skills are software companies today looking for in a fresh out of school individual? Well, that's a good one. That's a good one, and another perfect segue. Um, so thank you again. So, um, well, look, I, I, this kind of goes, first of all, you're in a field where, uh, there's a lot of demand, which is a great thing. Um, 
you can work from anywhere, which is another great thing. You have ultimate geographic flexibility. Um, you know, hopefully this COVID thing will be over so that when you go to the office, um, you'll be able to have to go to, you'll be, you'll have an office to go to and you'll have like people to hang out with because like, I'll tell you one thing is like my engineers, like they all become such good friends. So like, and you see that all the time, like engineers, um, and people in software, it's just, they're chill environments usually, you know? So it's a good thing. And it, it would be a shame if, uh, this goes on much longer where people aren't hanging out with one another, but back to the question, what are people looking for? So you need to be able to, um, have, you need to be smart. So that's one thing is that, you know, we look for typically people who are able to communicate well, you know, um, we want people who can solve a problem that we provide to them. Like you'd be shocked when um, I used to do, um, used to go to these career fairs that I was mentioning and I would go to, um, you know, the, those things over where the basketball courts are or whatever, uh, the <laughs> yep. borough, I guess it's called, right? Um, is where they do the career fairs. And so people would stop by the booth and I'd be, I'd ask them something, what I thought was very elementary. I would say in a language of your choice, write a function that would sum up the numbers in an array. Um, and if they got that one right, I would, or I, I can't remember if I would like do it sequentially or if I would alternate that with like, write a function that would average um, the numbers in an array. And you'd be shocked by the amount of people that would just like, like just give up and walk away. Like they couldn't do something that basic. Um, you need to be able to have some fluency with, um, you know, basic programming ideas and data structures and things like that. Um, there's, it really helps to have some experience. Like if you work on an open source project or if you have, if you've done an internship or something like that, um, then there's, you know, those are all really good ways for you to get experience, but we want to see experience. We want to see the ability to work in a team. Um, a very important skill that some engineers don't have is the ability to admit when they're wrong. Um, Cause you, you know, one thing to take to heart is that your ideas are not you, you know, they're not, your work is not you. It's not your ego. Your work is your work. It's separate. But a lot of engineers are so tied up with their intelligence and, you know, they can't be found wrong. And it's very important to say, I screwed up because if you don't in engineering, literally planes can crash. So you need to be able to have that skill to be able to say, hey, I screwed up, sorry. And, and everybody knows it's software, there's bugs, you know? So people who are humble, who, who have um, good communication skills, who aren't all like prideful and caught up in themselves, huge deal for software teams. We like to work with like chill, accountable people. Awesome. Um, I had a, I had someone wrote me in the, in the private chat. Um, they asked, uh, do you currently have any jobs available right now? Um, and if you do, or if you don't, what are some of the different opportunities you may have in the future? Uh, just so, well, they were just saying, just so they could kind of plan and, and see if something could work out for them. Yeah, no. Um, in our, on our team, we basically have the following departments that NISA students have been hired into. So we'll have, uh, for example, um, we have our customer support department, which is for more of the like business oriented people that don't have the hardcore skills, right? Um, so for, if, you, if you're not like a programmer or something like that, you want uh, an entry into a software company, a lot of people start in support. And from there, we've had people grow from support into engineering positions, um, into QA positions, um, into even sales positions. So, you know, they get their feet in the door of a software company. It's not that big of a place. They get exposure to these different departments. We see standout people. We provide the opportunity when a spot opens for them in one of those departments. So um, that's the customer support team. There's, um, you know, there's, uh, there's the engineering team. And basically those are the people that are the programmers and they build stuff, right? So we have people on the engineering team. Um, Sometimes we have uh, direct opportunities on the engineering team. Those don't come up that often. Um, what's probably more likely is, uh, especially for internships, is help with writing automated testing. So we're big believers in testing our software and we're big believers in coding that uh, testing and using automated platforms. 
So, um, you know, QA positions co co can come up, um, you know, engineering positions can come up and support positions can come up. And I, I do apologize, Jonathan, I don't know off the top of my head what we're looking for right now. That's okay. I, I, I know I'd asked um, Christina when, when I was checking in with her with other stuff earlier in the week. Um, and she just said, if anybody is interested, they don't, I, she said she didn't see anything currently. Um, but if I guess I can go on your uh, jobs page, she said to just send your resume at any time to opportunities at rocketmatter.com. And even though you may not have anything available, you never know if something could come up or if there's something that's in your resume that would intrigue them to say, hey, this could be an opportunity. And it does show that you have a couple current positions. So it says marketing manager, business development representative, software customer support specialist, software quality assurance analyst, and software engineer. So those may be, I don't know if those are kind of like your templates of opportunities. Um, yeah, I would take a look at those opportunities if any of those appeals to you. Um, you know, let us know um, because we're always looking for good people. Um, and, you know, one thing we're always looking for is more sales. So if you're on the more of the business or the MIS side of the whole equation, um, it is really valuable for us to find people that are interested in sales that um, also have kind of a technical expertise. Um, so, um, one thing I would like to kind of like just to address real quick are resumes, um, because I don't really agree with the philosophy that you're taught by a lot of the uh, career counselors in universities or high schools or wherever for that matter. But um, I think it's very important when you have a resume um, that you that you do not try and shrink it to one page just to make people happy. Um, like if you have the experience and you think it's relevant, I think it's very important that you put that experience on the resume. I, I'm, I'm telling you this as someone who has looked at thousands of resumes, right? Um, <clears throat> so, I mean, what I'm telling you is basically from the perspective of somebody who, have to, who has to sift through a lot of them, right? Um, and I've been on the other side, I've had to get hired before. You know, the resume should look nice. Um, it should, you know, you should choose your fonts carefully. Um, you know, you, you, it doesn't have to be, it should not be over the top, but it should be clean. It should be elegant. Um, you know, you don't, you really don't want misspellings. Um, because in the reason that you don't want misspellings or stupid mistakes like that is that when you're going through thousands of resumes, you're going to look for any excuse you can to toss one in the trash. So don't give somebody the excuse to toss your resume in the trash. That's way more important than keeping your resume to one page. In fact, the keeping your resume to one page thing is not, it has no relevance any longer because most resumes are received um, electronically. So, um, you know, uh, what else can I tell about resumes? I like it when people put their interests on it um, at the end. So uh, when you put your interests at the end, like if you're in, in you may strike gold. You, you just do not know because if, if you're interested in something and you might think this is kind of strange, um, but like, let's say that you're huge into board games and you put board games on the resume or something like that and, and interests or you like to run, there's a good chance that you're gonna interview with somebody who also likes those kind of things and you can strike up a total conversation because to, the, to be honest, like when you're interviewing somebody like on my side of the desk, you look for any excuse not to actually talk about work. Like if I can find, if I look at something and I'm like, oh, this guy like plays video games. I'm like, okay, cool. What video games do you play? Um, or whatever it is, or you're into squirrels. I mean, God bless you, but that's strange. But whatever, you know, whatever your interests are, list them. Um, I mean, I love to read. If I encounter a candidate that like was like super into reading, like likes to read history and novels and stuff like that, I'll talk all day long and then I'll ask them one question about their experience. So it's important. I'm not the best interviewer, if you haven't noticed. So um, the other thing is that um, another concern on your resume is that I, I I think if you have experience, put your experience first. Um, so if you have, if you've worked on an open source project or if you've had an internship or you, if you've worked at Subway, put that first um, before the education. The education is important, but we wanna make sure that people can work on teams. Any team experience you've had, list it. If you were like on a, 
football team in high school, if you play for a team in college, if you, you know, whatever it is, whatever, if you're on a debate team, we want to know that people can work on teams. So like list whatever team experience that you've had. I think that's important. Um, you know, um, do not list projects in school as experience. So unless you did it in corp and, and you did it in conjunction with a um, industry partner. So if for one of your courseworks, for example, you coded something for Rocket Matter or you coded something for modernizing medicine or Motorola or something like that, then yeah, that makes sense to list it. But don't, I've seen resumes where people like list like whatever sorting algorithm implementation they did when they were in their data structures class. So don't do that. Um, but um, in general, if you can, if you have the experience, put the experience first. If you don't, and it's an entry level, it's a true entry level thing, and you've never had an internship before, nothing wrong with that e either. Awesome. Uh, so we had a couple of people write in the chat. Um, someone had wrote, um, how important is LinkedIn and having an updated LinkedIn account um, for you when it comes to the interviewing process? Um, I think LinkedIn is a helpful tool for you um, because you can, um, if you have a, you know, it, it doesn't cost a lot of money and it can even be friend if you, it can be even be free if you have your like friend um, put a picture up, um, you know, like, like just a nice looking professional picture, you know, on LinkedIn. Um, you know, it's good to have, I think it's good to have a presence on LinkedIn. Is it critical? No, I think you should because it shows that you're like paying attention to what's going on. Like if you don't have a LinkedIn profile, maybe I think like, okay, this guy's really green. So if you do have a LinkedIn profile, even if you have very limited experience and it just says that you're a student looking for opportunities, I think that's fine. Um, you know, and, and also just having a LinkedIn profile allows you to uh, take part in the LinkedIn HR marketplace because there's a lot of, I mean, companies very heavily use LinkedIn for recruiting. So aside from like Indeed, I would say in headhunters, I would say like LinkedIn is, is a good way to get the process started. Awesome. Um, so I don't see anything else. We got about like 10 minutes or so left. So does anybody else have anything um, that they wanted to ask Larry um, that you haven't asked already? Um, I'm trying to like scroll through the chat and see if there's anything that I missed. Uh, so you can pop your mic on too if you, if you need to. Um, Oh, someone did mention, uh, speaking of LinkedIn, that we are having a LinkedIn session. We usually have one once every semester. Uh, so for those of you, as Larry was talking about, um, if you haven't put a LinkedIn uh, profile together and you're looking for some of the tips and some of the things we can do, we have one later on in the semester. So, uh, so Larry, maybe we'll pull up yours in that session and, and let them see what a good looking one is, right? No. <laughs> well, uh, actually, if you, um, if you, if you want to, like I have included a lot of kind of elements from like best practices. So mine is actually a good one to take a look at. Um, I haven't like, I don't, I'm not, I don't think I'll ever need to really search for a job. So it's not like I, <laughs> the one thing that I don't do is I don't, um, I don't ask people for recommendations just because I haven't had the need to, but um, getting recommendations is, I think, uh, you know, that, that it may be a, a couple of different wrinkles for entry level seekers that I'm not aware of. Um, there is a good resource, I would say that, it, you know, if you want to pop on over to Barnes and Noble, um, there's a, at least it used to be, and Jonathan, you tell me, I don't know, you may or may not know this, there used to be a, a book that they would publish updated every year called Knock Em Dead, like Knock Em Dead. Um, and it would have like the year after it. So it'd be knock them dead 2020 edition or whatever. Um, and what it is, is it's basically uh, a cookbook, uh, meaning like a series of recipes on how to find a job. And it advocates sending out a lot of feelers and, and basically casting a huge wide net. Um, you know, for those of you that are master students, maybe you're undergraduate uh, and you, you have the FAU network, which is, more extensive than you think, um, leveraging the FAU alumni network, um, leveraging if you had an undergraduate degree, their network too, um, being creative on LinkedIn. You know, the thing about LinkedIn that you can do that's, that's really powerful is it allows you to research companies. Let's say that you are interested in, in working for Rocket Matter or you are interested in working for modernizing medicine or 
some of the other uh, technology companies that are here in Boca. Um, <clears throat> you can go and you can find people that have jobs there, you know? Um, and if you reach out to them, you can, you can kind of tell who's more active on LinkedIn than others, which means that like, it might be easier to contact them than others. And even in, and when I mean contact them, you may be able to discern their email address either through their LinkedIn profile or figuring it out because you know that everybody that works at that company is first name dot last name at company name dot com, mm. you know? So um, you, you can use LinkedIn to do a lot of sleuthing. And so, um, but there's all sorts of different ways to like um, get in front of people. But I think by being part of Misa, that's a very strong first step. Awesome. Um, so we had another student ask, uh, how important is a master's degree to you as an employer? Uh, <laughs> I think I remember this from a past session. <laughs> I mean, look, I, 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 I think there is, I think if I see a master's degree, uh, ultimately we're looking at, can the person do the job and are they a good team player? Meaning are they not an asshole who's not un, like, who's not accountable, right? Mm -hmm. We need accountable people who are fun to be around, who um, are good at their jobs, right? That's what we're looking for essentially. So does a master's degree help? It might give me an extra second when I'm cruising through a resume pile to give this person more of a benefit of the doubt because they have more, um, they, they may have more experience because they're going to be a little bit older. So that, that there, you know, there's, there's things about master's degrees that, that, that are good, but in general, it really, what it really boils down to is um, can the person do the job and are they a good fit for the team? Now I will tell you that when I got my job at Morgan Stanley, I made more money than my peers who were just bachelor's um, degree people um, because I had a master's degree. I made like $10,000 more starting a year. That's awesome. Um, so someone else had asked um, if they wanted to do an internship, they didn't see anything on the, on the website for internships. Um, would they just send their resume to that opportunities at rocket matter? And then if you saw that there was some kind of interest, that could be something that um, could be put together. Um, yeah. If, if you're interested in an internship or something like that, write an email that, you know, I guess it would be called a cover letter, but you know, the email where you attach your resume, just tell us like what you're looking for, what your interests are, and uh, we can see if we have a fit for you. Awesome. Um, so anything else uh, for Larry? We only got, you know, maybe like five minutes or so left. Um, so anybody else have any other questions that maybe I missed as I'm trying to like scroll through the chat? Um, or you can pop on Is your mic. Go ahead. These are all really good questions, I think. And um, you, you guys are thinking about the right things. Um, and I will tell you this, like starting the career is the hard part. I think you just need to get the ball rolling and it might feel a little frustrating or intimidating, but you just gotta get out there and roll with the punches a little bit. And you might take some missteps, but you can get back on track, you know? Um, I, I did, like my career didn't start out um, the way I thought I wanted to, but you know, and that was a little tough. That was a tough time because you kind of have to take a look in the mirror and you'd be like, do I really want to do this? Um, and for me, you know, I had been studying film for so long and thinking about it for so long that when, when I finally really said, you know, I don't want to be doing this, that took some guts. Mm -hmm. And then when I wrote my first line of code and I fell in love with it, that was a, a really awesome return to like a direction. So it may not be a straight linear path is what I'm saying. Mm. And that's, that's okay. Cool. Yeah. And speaking of, 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 of coding, a couple of them are asking, uh, when did you first start learning coding? Because I know you kind of talked a little bit about that in the beginning. And then another one asked, do you still code? So. <laughs> yeah, I wish I coded more. Um, so um, I, look, I mean, I guess maybe sometime a little bit of that is the grass is always greener, but um, you know, I can't really participate in the development of the product anymore because I get pulled in so many different directions that if I were to commit to de developing a feature, the feature would be delayed and that would be fair to the team. But what I can do is I can write queries against the database so I can still write SQL. Um, 
you know, every once in a while, I'll like, I'll write Python scripts for no reason. Like, um, you know, like I'll integrate with Google Calendar just so I can like um, manipulate my Google Calendar from the command line in Mac OS or whatever. Um, so eventually, uh, when I do have more time, I, I probably will get back involved and do um, get involved with like an open source project, maybe one that's involved with like um, some sort of like social justice movement or something, because there are things that are out there like that. Um, but right now I don't get to code anymore. The first line of code I ever wrote, believe it or not, was uh, in a language called Ada. Ada is uh, used in uh, military aircraft and like Boeing jets and things like that because it has it's like what's known as a very strongly typed language. Like you would never like the way Ada is constructed, you would never have a runtime error where a pointer is pointing off the end of an array. That would not happen. Like, because when you're running a jumbo jet and people's lives are at stake, you do not want like an index out of bounds exception to like bring down a jet. So um, Ada's, com Ada's compiler works in a very particular way. So my first, and it was developed at NYU. So NYU is where I got my graduate degree. So I learned to program in Ada. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Mm -hmm. Uh, so this is a good question someone had asked. Um, did you have a mentor at the time you started your business? Yeah, you got to have a mentor. Um, so you just have to because there's just too much to – starting a business is, like, not that hard, to be honest. Like, basically, you go to sunbiz.org and file your LLC uh, with Sunbiz for, like, 125 bucks. You get an accountant. Uh, you need the accountant and you need a lawyer and they can kind of walk you through things. Um, but, and, and then the other thing that you need is you need a product and you need good customer service and you have a business. So um, it's not that, that hard, but it, you, there's all the human situations that arise are crazy and, you know, separating people, like knowing which books to read and, and separating people into, um, you know, um, you know, roles and responsibilities and, and, and creating culture and things like that. And, um, and just making it, all that stuff, like it really helps to be able to bounce ideas off of people because the, like running a company is a lot like riding a roller coaster. Like you're going to have days that are like, you're, you're super high and everything's working awesome. And then you're going to have horrible days where like your worst, your best customer leaves. Like it, 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 you go, your emotions swing so wildly. So it is not for the faint of heart. Like you got to be able to, um, you got to be able to deal with some serious ups and downs and keep a pretty even keel. Like I would not recommend it if um, you're prone to like super bouts of anxiety. Like it, it'll, it'll just drive you mad. Um, but it's always worth the thing about the engineering business and, and, you know, computer science and things like that is that if you, you have these hard skills in your life um you can go ahead and try it and if it doesn't work what's the worst thing that happens so you'll you know you try to business for a year or two and then you go get another job i mean that's the that's the beauty of having a concrete skill is that you can always get another job that's great um and i think we're coming close to the end here at the time so i think that's kind of like a great um end point to kind of wrap that up um so what I'll do, I'll go ahead and just stop the recording and stop the sharing because that's kind of a good, a good pausing point there. Um, so let me go ahead and do 